Good to see you this morning. Man, oh man. You know what? We are so blessed that you guys are coming to church. Aren't we church? This is your church of tomorrow. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hey, I want to ask you something. Does anybody know what we're getting ready to celebrate or we're starting to celebrate? You've listened. What is it, Toby? Christmas. Christmas. How many people agree with Toby? Christmas, right? Now, let me ask you this. Um, How many people know that Christmas is a miracle? The miracle of Christmas. Now, do you know what miracles are? Somebody tell me what a miracle is. What's a miracle? Olivia? Yeah. That's a good explanation. It's something that you just, you can't explain. It just happens. But it doesn't just happen for, for no reason. Who is behind every miracle? Somebody tell me, who causes every miracle? Jacob? God, God causes every miracle. You see, if we could understand it, it would not be called a miracle. So God does every miracle. So what are some miracles that you know about in the Bible? What are some miracles that you know of? Toby? Okay, so your pancakes were hot when you started, right? <laughs> and then you took them apart, and they were, were they good pancakes? Okay, were they good pancakes? Okay, and what kind of syrup did you have on the pan? Did you put syrup on the pancakes? Were there blueberries in the pancakes? Who made the pancakes? Praise God for your mom. Amen? <laughs> Amen. All right, now, what are some miracles that you know of in the Bible? Layla? He made the crippled walk. That's great. What else, Hunter? Um, Daniel and the lions. That was a miracle. Daniel and the lions did. The lions didn't need him. What's another miracle? Carson? The lepers, the lepers right. We talked about that last week, right? What else, Jacob? Um, Mary being chosen by God's uh, That was a great miracle. We, we hear all kind of miracles, and, and Jesus did all kind of miracles. But do you know that the, Jesus being born was a miracle? Because Jesus wasn't just a child that was born. When you celebrate Christmas, you're celebrating a miracle. So who does miracles? Tell me again. God does miracles. And when you celebrate Christmas, you're celebrating a miracle because Jesus was not like me and you. Jesus came from heaven to be born here on this earth. Jesus became a miracle because Mary, Mary was not the the woman that, that, went with her husband, and all of a sudden they had a child. God chose Mary to have a child. And Jesus, who was in heaven, all of a sudden was in Mary, and then was born in Bethlehem. And the miracle was that God was the one that caused it. And then the other miracle is that Jesus grew up. He died on a cross. He was buried. And then there was another miracle, right? What was that miracle? Tell me again, Hunter. He rose again, right? So his life was full of miracles, but his birth was a miracle. So when you celebrate Christmas this year, I want you to know that you're celebrating a miracle. So when somebody says Merry Christmas to you, I want you to say Merry Miracle back to them, okay? Can you do that? And I want you to understand that Jesus' birth was a miracle. It'll make them ask you, why did you say Merry Miracle? And you'll learn today that it was a miracle that Jesus was born, and we're supposed to we're supposed to celebrate that miracle. That's what we're doing at Christmas. Merry Hanukkah. Yeah, you're in the wrong church, uh, <laughs> Jacob. But some people do celebrate uh, that. That's not what we celebrate, okay? All right, let's pray. Father God, I love you. I praise you. I thank you for this day. I thank you, God, for these children. I pray you, you would just open their minds and hearts, Lord, that let them see that, Lord, Everything that you've done since Jesus came to this earth was a miracle, especially his birth. God, as we celebrate Christmas, I just pray, Lord, as they watch the adults and as they learn, Lord, what Christmas is about, I pray, God, that you would just save a spot in their mind, Lord. Make it a a spot that they can remember the, the miracle of Christmas. And, Lord, not so much the presents, the games, the activities, the shopping, the hurrying around that they see all the adults doing, Lord, but let them know the miracle. 
for the miracle that you had for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. I've got fruity snacks for you this morning, okay? Who wants fruity snacks? Sure. You're welcome. You're welcome. You guys, some of you have got the please and thank you down from last week, don't you? You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Here you go. You're welcome. Now, if you guys have not started kindergarten yet, you can go to Children's Church. If you have your Bible, stand up and raise it above your head, please. Amen. Bear witness of God's words. You may be seated. Let me explain to you what happens is when it's below freezing in the morning and the building gets cold and so it's put on heat and as the people come into the building and the heat gets it to a certain temperature, you guys get it hotter. So at that point when it gets too hot to where it's too hot even in the winter, the air conditioning comes on. And when the air conditioning comes on, then you smell what smell you smell because the air conditioning hadn't been on a while for the heat. So we've got that out of the way, right? All right. Thank God for air conditioning. Thank God for heat. How many people have your Bibles? Turn to Luke chapter 1, John chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, John chapter 1. They're right beside of each other, so books beside of each other. This morning, I want to talk to you about miracles. Can you say that with me? Miracles. Again, miracles. miracles. We don't talk a lot about miracles, and sometimes we put things in a category that aren't really miracles, and we call them miracles, and sometimes we never realize there's a miracle to it. Sometimes people take credit for miracles, but I want to talk to you about miracles, but in order to do that, I want to give you the definition of miracle. Are you ready? According to Webster in the dictionary, miracle means a supernatural event regarded as due to divine action. A supernatural event regarded as due to divine action. Now, I agree mostly with that. It's just that it seems like if you don't specify God and just put divine, somebody could say, well, it is their divine or it is their higher power. I would like to say a miracle is a supernatural event regarded as due to God's divine action, okay? So a miracle is something we can't explain, we can't understand. But I was reading, as I was researching this, I came across a quote, actually a definition by Frederick Buchner. And this to me was beautiful. I thought, man, this is great. So I wrote it down to to read it to you. He explained what a miracle was. He said, a miracle is when the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. When the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. What do you mean? Well, it just, it just isn't anything that we can calculate when you add up everything. In other words, he said, the miracle is when one plus one equals a thousand. I thought, you're exactly right. I remember when five loaves and two fish equaled 5,000, right? And so that was a miracle, and that's what he's saying. We can't explain it. It's not by logic. It's not by reason. So today I want to talk about miracles, but specifically, now get this, I want to talk about the miracle before the miracle. The miracle before the miracle. Say that with me. Now just one more time. And I want to ask you this. How many of you have seen a miracle in the past year? How many of you have seen a miracle in the past month, in the past week? How many of you have seen a miracle today? All right, now look around. All right, now, I want to tell you that most all of you have seen a miracle. And I want to explain that today, not by my logic or intellect. I want to explain it by God's Word. I was reading and studying about this and he revealed some things that I thought were pretty neat, things that I'd read all my life, but I'd never put them together. And 
praise God for his discernment of his word. So I want to share it with you today about the miracle before the miracle. And it comes as a, as a parallel teaching from a miracle that happened before a miracle that we know of in the Bible. Of course, we come together today and we talk about Christmas as Christmas is close at hand. And the birth of Jesus, we accept it as a miracle, don't we? I hope you do. Do you accept the birth of Jesus as a miracle? You see, we have to accept the birth of Jesus as a miracle if we want to fully accept Jesus as our Savior. Did you hear that? If you want to accept Jesus as your Savior, you say, I'm saved. You can't not believe in the miracle of the birth of Jesus. It's part of Jesus. Now, we can't believe in the miracles that Jesus did unless we believe in the power of God that allowed him to do these miracles. We read about the miracles of Jesus, and these kids were talking about it, the healing of the lepers, the healing of the blind, the crippled, the feeding of the 5,000, all those things that he did. But understand, Jesus... Jesus was given the power by God to do these miracles. And the birth of Jesus was not a miracle that Jesus performed. The birth of Jesus was a miracle that God performed. So this morning, I know a lot of people get confused when you start talking about God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. I hope it becomes clear this morning. I've asked God to be able to just open our minds so that we can have clarity about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus coming to this earth was a miracle. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus always existed. You see, lots of babies are born. And I honestly believe that every baby born is a miracle. If you've ever seen a baby born, fathers who have been there and witnessed the baby being born, is that not the the most miraculous thing you've ever seen? Mothers, when you carry that child, and, and is that not the most miraculous thing you've ever seen? It's a miracle. It's hard to believe that two rocks collided that many million years ago and people keep having babies, right? It's a miracle of science. No, it's not. It's a miracle of God. You see, Jesus always existed as part of God, but God performed a miracle when Jesus became a human being. I don't want you to take my word for it, but I do want to use God's word to substantiate what I'm saying. In John chapter 1, where I ask you to turn, you'll realize that John 1 is divided into several sections, but the first section is telling about Jesus, who he always has been. So, John 1 says, in the beginning was the word. Now, notice here, this is important. Word should be capitalized in your Bible. W-O-R-D, capital W, right? Because word is a name. It's a proper name. It's capitalized, right? If, you, if, word, if your Bible is not using the word word or the word word isn't capitalized, see me after church and we will get you a Bible. <laughs> this is that important. Why? Because it's describing Jesus. Word is what Jesus was called before he was called Jesus. You say, wait, wait, wait a minute. I don't want to think about that. That's too deep. You see, God tells you at some point in time, you have to get off the milk and get on the meat. This morning, we're going to get on the meat, okay? Word was Jesus' name before. That's the way God described him because word, what do we know word is? Word is an expression, right? If I want something, I would be able to speak words to Justin. Justin, would you stand up here, please? Would you hand me your Bible? All right, how did you know to hand me your Bible? You told me to. And what did I use to tell you? Your lips. Uh, and what did my lips say? What we've been talking about. Words, Words, right? Words, right? That's the way I communicated. Good. <laughs> Jesus is an expression of God to us. That's the way he described him. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men, and that light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. He was with God in the beginning with God. So Jesus was back then. The book of Philippians tells us that he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, right? He was made into Jesus the baby. By God. Also, 
you'll understand if you say, well, I don't know about that. Jesus being here, well, as soon as you open the book of Genesis chapter 1 and you learn about creation, which is the real way that we, that we were able to be here today, Amen. and you get to verse 26 of chapter 1, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. You see, God is so great, he's plural. God is so great, he's plural, right? What God can claim they're plural besides my God, right? Your God. He's God the Father, he's God the Son, he's God the Holy Ghost. But God the Son wasn't God the Son until he became the Son born in a manger. And that's what we're celebrating. You see, notice the miracle of John. Chapter 1. We learn that Jesus always was, but then you get to verse 14. And it says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of a, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Did you see the miracle? The Word which was in heaven became flesh and dwelt among us. He was one of us. Glory to God. You know, he couldn't have died for our sins unless he would have been one of us that never yielded to temptation. You see, he was the perfect lamb, but he had to be man to be the perfect lamb, to be the sacrifice for our sins. You see, God became flesh. That's the miracle. And when God became flesh, he was named Jesus. If you remember, there was an angel that appeared to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 and he told Joseph he said and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Jesus wasn't named yet. He told him because the father named him Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. So God had a plan. There was a miracle to be born in Bethlehem and we need to understand that this first miracle that had anything to do with Jesus was the birth of Jesus, which was done by God. And that's when God became flesh and blood. And another miracle of his birth was that he was born of a virgin. I want to stress that today. He was born of a virgin. You say, that doesn't make sense. Exactly. It's a miracle, right? Do you understand that you can't fully understand and accept the Lord Jesus Christ unless you can accept something that you can't understand that's what he calls faith the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen that's faith he asks us and he says it's impossible for us to please god without faith you have to accept jesus christ died on a cross for your sins how many people saw it happen no one right we didn't see it happen we have to accept it by faith so the virgin birth you have to accept that by faith can you understand how in the world does a child Come into this world in a mother's womb without a father and a mother coming together physically and the part of the father and the part of the mother mingling the way that we know that it's supposed to. Without the father, it cannot happen. It can happen. It did happen. His name is Jesus. He was a miracle, right? It's part of the reason we celebrate Christmas. It's the virgin birth. If you read in Luke chapter 1, I told you to turn to Luke, you'll realize that there was a section of verses there that, well, the the angel was describing to Mary, listen and I'll read with you. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. We'll start there. It says, in the sixth month, this is important now, in the sixth month, which month? Sixth this, we'll come back to that. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin. To a what? Virgin. That means that she has not been with a man. She's never been with a man. To a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the, th of the house of David. And the virgin, called her virgin again, his name was Mary. And the angel came into her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name, second time what? Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be seeing I know not a man? Again, Mary was saying, 
how is this possible? But she wasn't doubting. She was just reaffirming, I'm a virgin. I've never had sexual relations with a man, ever, ever. And that's the third time we've heard that. And then, verse 35, the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born in thee shall be called the Son of God. So the second part of the miracle, verse 27, it tells you Mary was a virgin. Verse 31 and 32 Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. How can you conceive and bring forth if you've never had sexual relationships? How can a woman do that? Well, I don't understand. I don't, I, you can't explain it. It's a miracle. Verse 34, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Well, of course, Mary knew her own self. She knew that this had never happened. She wasn't doing like we do sometimes, where we remind God of the logic of things, don't we? Surely you've done this before, right? God, I would like you to answer this prayer in a specific way. Can you give me this and this and this? As if we think God has forgotten something. How in the world is God going to do this if he doesn't do this? How is he going to do B if he doesn't do A? Anybody ever pray like this? So we've heard about the miracle of the birth of Jesus. How many people believe that the birth of Jesus is a miracle. Yeah. What do you celebrate at Christmas? You celebrate a miracle, right? And I'm not here today to talk to you about the miracle of the birth of Jesus at Christmas. I'm here today to talk to you about the miracle before the miracle. Now say that with me, the miracle before the miracle. The miracle before the miracle. And when you leave here today, you're going to realize the significance of the miracle before the miracle. Even today, this many years after, the Bible tells us specifically that there was a miracle before the miracle of the birth of Jesus. Well, what do you mean? Well, if you continue to read in Luke chapter 1 where we were a minute ago, and you start with verse 36, you see, Mary had just been told, just been told, she was going to have a child. Now, her mind was, think about it, but she was full of faith. Because if you read on, you'll see that she says, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Whatever you say, Lord. I don't understand it, but I'm, I'm all down for it, right? That was Mary. Well, what happened? Well, this miraculous thing happened. The Bible says that the presence of the Holy Ghost, read verse 25, 35, excuse me. The angel answered and said, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and shall the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. There also... That holy thing which shall be born in thee shall be called the Son of God. She was going to have a seed put in her by God. And let me stop here and say, anybody, anybody that you hear preaching today that tells you that it was a sexual act between God Almighty and Mary, you need to never listen to them again because that's blasphemy. The Bible tells you that the Holy Spirit came upon her, overshadowed her. God didn't, God didn't have to have sexual relationship with Mary. God made every human being. He spoke everything into existence. So he took the son that was in heaven and transferred him to the earth in the womb of Mary so that he could come to this earth as a human being. Now Mary just received all of this news, this miraculous news. Now look at verse 36 because the angel was not through speaking. I want to show you the miracle before the miracle. Do you remember when we started off in verse 26 and it said in the sixth month? Well, something's been happening in Luke chapter 1 before we got to this part. What's been happening is, well, the angel has went and saw someone else. Listen to verse 36 as I read. And behold thy cousin Elizabeth. She hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. Oh, verse 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Amen. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it to me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into the city of Judah. Now, we're not really going to talk so much about the entire story of the birth of John the Baptist, even though that's what we're talking about. There's a, it's a long story, 
I, don't, I want to talk about the miracle before the miracle. And see, the miracle before the miracle happened in Luke 1. And in order to read you the beginning, go back to Luke 1. Let me paint the scene for you, the picture here. Still opening up our minds so that we can understand the miracle before the miracle. There was a man named Zacharias. He was a priest. His wife's name was Elizabeth. She happened to be the cousin of Mary. Elizabeth, well, she was a descendant of Aaron. But Zacharias was also because he was of the priestly order. And the priest, it says he was of the, uh, a certain tribe. And this certain tribe or of the priest or a certain sect of the priest, they had a certain turn. They went in and served. And his turn was to go in and burn incense before the most holy place. You had to kept, keep the fire burning, right? And so his turn to go in. And when he went in, something miraculous happened. There was an angel that appeared to him and told him some news. That there was going to be another miraculous birth. That his wife that was barren, who had never been able to have children, who had prayed, was going to have a child. It was going to be the second cousin of Jesus. His name was going to be John the Baptist. Let's read about it really quickly. Luke chapter 1, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife were the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and both were now well stricken in years. That means they were old. And it came to pass, and while he executed the priest's office before the God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him the angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children." And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. Not like Mary. Mary was just saying, I haven't known a man. How can this happen? Zacharias was actually doubting. We find that out because Zacharias was punished. The angel answering said unto him, Zacharias, I'm just putting that in there. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Can you understand? This man was a priest and Gabriel reminded him the same way that we should be reminded. Gabriel said, did I just tell you it was going to happen? I came and I'm a messenger of God. I stand in the presence of God Almighty. Who are you to tell me you're too old? Who are you to tell me your wife is barren? God made your wife. He knit her together in her mother's womb and he made you too. I stand in the presence of God. You will not be able to speak until this child is born. By the way, when he's born, name him John. If you know the story, you know that the first words he was able to say when he finally got loosened his tongue was, Name him John, right? Miracle here, right? But it's significant because it was the miracle before the miracle. Six months before the miracle of Jesus' birth, we have this story, right? Now, understand the significance of this. You see, if we read verses 5 through 18, we'll understand that they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. They were well stricken in years, which means they were too old logically, physically, to have a child. The parts of her that receive the parts of him as far as nurturing and the egg being able to, to be able to grow and nurture a baby 
were too old. Her womb could not support a baby. And we know this happens. So how can God reverse this? God can reverse the sun shining, right? The movement of the sun. So understand, this was the miracle. Now, listen to what the purpose of John will be. I want you to realize the miracle was going to be named John. We know him as John the Baptist, but listen to what the purpose of John will be. This is important. God's plan was for there to be a miracle before the miracle. I want you to notice here that John the Baptist's birth was a miracle that needed to happen before the miracle of the birth of Jesus, had to happen before the birth of Jesus. The Bible gives us the reasons God needed John the Baptist to be here before Jesus. Here's the reasons he was the miracle before the miracle. Did you hear me say that so many times before? Listen to what God's purpose for John was and why it was important that there was this miracle. If you look back at verse 15, we learn about John this. The Bible says he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Again, you'll hear Jesus later on in his ministry say, there is no man ever born of a woman that's as great as John the Baptist. The second part of verse 15, it says he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Now you need to understand something. You would have to read on over to where Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, ascended into heaven before the Holy Spirit came onto the scene. This was untypical. This was miraculous, the Holy Ghost. He was going to be born with the Holy Ghost in him. Verse 17, it says, And he, that's John, shall go before him, that's Jesus. He before him, John before Jesus, in the spirit and the power of Elijah, or Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Listen, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The Lord hasn't come. John's job is to prepare a people. John's purpose was to minister about Jesus, to turn people's hearts to Jesus, prepare people to meet Jesus when he came. Now, later on, as Luke chapter 1 continues... John the Baptist is born. Zechariah's mouth was opened. Zechariah, well, he began to praise the Lord. I'm telling you, he praised the Lord. He was on fire, right? Now, verse 76 and 77, listen to what he says about John the Baptist. He proclaimed God's purpose for John the Baptist. He says, and thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go. What's that word? Before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. What a job, right? He's to go before Jesus comes and he's to teach people and tell people about Jesus. And that they need to repent, repent of their sins, right? And accept Jesus' blood to cover their sins. Now that's just Luke 1. If you went back to John 1... You know, that's where we're flip-flopping between. We learned about Jesus and that he always existed. We heard that he became flesh and dwelt among us. If you go further in John than verse 5, you'll realize that John 1 begins to talk about John the Baptist. So turn back to John 1. What we're learning here is about the miracle before the miracle. Listen to verse 6 of John Chapter 1, he speaks about John, not Jesus anymore. He says, there was a man sent from God whose name was what? And that's John the Baptist. The same came for a witness. What was he? To bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that great light. That was the true light, which light every man that cometh into the world. Now, pretty interesting here that when we get to John, he was described as a man sent from God. That's what we call a miracle, right? Sent from God. In verses 7, basically, he says the, came, the same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. So, John was a what? Witness. What was he witnessing of? The light. The light, capital L, should be. The light is who? Jesus. Does it say John was the light? No. 
but he was sent to bear witness of the light. So you say, you're going in a lot of detail. I am. I want you to grasp this because it's all going to come full circle. You're going to realize the significance of the miracle before the miracle. And it's not just a historical reference. So, so are you with me so far? I just need to know. I'll recap so briefly what we've learned so that you'll know about the miracle before the miracle, John before Jesus. You ready? This is what we need to see about the purpose of the miracle before the miracle. The miracle of the birth of John the Baptist was a miracle that happened before the miracle of the birth of Jesus. What was the purpose of the miracle before the miracle? In other words, what was the purpose of John's Baptist birth before Jesus? His purpose is to be great in the sight of the Lord. Number two, his purpose was to be filled with the Holy Ghost. So his purpose was to take directions from the Holy Ghost that God was giving him. Number three, his purpose was to go out in front of Jesus or before Jesus to tell others about him before Jesus came. Number four, his purpose was to turn the hearts of people so they would be ready to accept Jesus. You know, no one can accept Jesus until after they repent. Repent means turn. You can't accept Jesus and pick him up on your way by him in life. You have to turn around to get Jesus. You have to stop something to get Jesus. You have to say, I'm not running my life anymore. I want to surrender my life, right? So, number five, his purpose was to prepare the way of the Lord. It says to give knowledge of salvation and to tell people that they need to repent of their sins. And number six, his purpose was to bear witness of the light. He was sent to be a witness of Jesus. So we learned about the purpose of the miracle before the miracle, right? So we can see that God had a specific purpose for performing the miracle of the birth of John the Baptist before Jesus. If you're with me so far, say, I'm with you. Right? Now, you can leave here today and now you would have some his, his, historical data. You would say, what a miracle God did back then. But, I want to share with you today some good news. You may think, well, this is good that God did this, but how does this apply to me? Now listen, listen close. I never saw this before. It was one of those things God just revealed. But it really let me see something that was deeper than the surface. And Today I want to go deeper than the surface of this story. We learn about this story all the time, but how does this story relate to me? And I think that's what we really need to grab hold of in the Scripture. You can read a story in the Bible, and you can treat it like a story in any other book, but the story in the Bible is, is going to be applicable to you. What you're trying to find in the Bible is how the Bible relates to you. It's not just another book. It's the book. It's given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. So listen. Here's what God was trying to show us that's below the surface. It's bigger and deeper than the surface of this story. You see, every one of us who accept Jesus Christ as our Savior are just like John the Baptist. You say, what do you mean? If you are here today and have accepted Jesus as your Savior, you are the miracle before the miracle. You say, I don't understand. Well, good, or I don't have anything to preach about. Right? If you've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, you are the miracle before the miracle. Let me explain. By comparing our life as a believer who accepts Jesus as their Savior to John the Baptist's life, we'll see that we are the miracle before the miracle. This should be especially good for someone who has considered their worth in this world and maybe has said, what good am I? Maybe you've lost your direction. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior and you haven't realized that there's a miraculous thing happening. And maybe you didn't realize that the person beside of you or the person that you saw in the mirror, miracle, in the mirror this morning was actually a miracle. You see, because some of you were scratching your heads saying, when was the last miracle I saw? Well, it should have been when you looked in the mirror this morning. Why? Our salvation is a miracle. You see... When we accept Jesus as our Savior, by believing in who He is and what He did, we repent of our sinful condition, we immediately have a miraculous birth, just like John. How about that? Amen. You say, what do you mean a miraculous birth? Well, can you explain how we can be born into the family of God? You say, who says we're born into the family of God? Hey, Jesus did. He told Nicodemus, John 3, 3, 
He said, Verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, didn't he? And then in verse 7, he says, Marvel not that I say to thee, you must be born again. Pretty, pretty substantial there, you know. And in John chapter 1, where we were reading before, verse 12 and 13, listen. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that have believed on his name, which were not born of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Our new birth is not a typical birth. It is not a flesh and blood birth that you can try to explain by science. To be born into the family of God is unexplainable how God can take me and put me into the family of God. And he continues to tell me my birth is miraculous. Why? Because if I read in Romans 3, I see that it's written, none are righteous, no, not one. How many people know that? And then it says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many people in here are part of all? And then it says, Romans 6, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So if I'm a sinner and you're a sinner, and if I get what my wages are that I deserve, I deserve death. The miraculous thing is God, full of grace and mercy, commended his love toward me. And that while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. What a miracle. And he can take me from getting death, which sin deserves. And he can save me by me repenting of my sin. It says if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. It's a belief, not just with my mouth, but God looks into my heart. That's a miracle. And he says when that happens, we are born not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. It's a new birth. I am my father's child. My dad, I can tell you his name, where he grew up. My DNA matches him, but my dad will pass away because my seed was corruptible. But my heavenly father has always been. His seed is incorruptible and it liveth forever. Amen. So I'm not born of corruptible seed when I'm born again and neither are you, right? So my birth, your birth, if you're saved, is miraculous, right? Hey, me and John and you and John have that in common, right? It's one of the reasons that we're the miracle before the miracle. Now, just like John's birth, our new birth, well, it's miraculous. You couldn't make it happen. I can't make it happen. You can't just be born into the family of God because your grandmom, your granddad, you went to a class, you passed a course, you got a certificate. It doesn't work that way. You have to go to him and I can't understand how God can save me and snatch me out of what I deserve, but he does. And I accept it by faith, right? So after we're miraculously born, number two, here's the next parallel. Can you believe this? Just like John, we are filled with the Holy Spirit from birth, from new birth. You ever thought about that? When God saves you, the Holy Spirit comes into you. Just like John. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. Now he which establisheth us with you is Christ, or establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us is God, whom also has sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Listen, here's a quote from John the Baptist. He said, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Right? When you're saved, the Holy Ghost comes into you. It leads you, it guides you, it directs you, just like John telling you it's the miracle before the miracle. Number three, our purpose is also like John. This miracle of our new birth, well, it's so that we can be a witness for Christ. Did you know that? God doesn't save you just so that you can go to heaven. He saves you so that you can take somebody with you. You're supposed to be a witness. Acts 1.8 says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be what? Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and all of Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. He saved us so that we could be witnesses once the power of the Holy Ghost comes upon us. And then understand our purpose is also like John's in that we're sent to teach others that they need to come and accept the salvation that God offers. You see, they they need to repent But you can't teach somebody to repent until you repent, until you're saved, until you have a miraculous birth, right? You say, well, how do you know that's the job God gave us? Well, Jesus had a little something he said in the 28th chapter of Matthew. It goes a little bit like this, 18, 19, 20. It says, and Jesus came and spoke 
unto them, saying, All power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Anyway, that was an authority statement. He said, Listen, I can say this because all power has been given to me. Now, he gives them an order. This is the Christian. This is to believers. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the earth. Amen. Go teach. Hey, what was John's job? Somebody remind me. Go teach, right? Be a witness. Number five. Just as the miracle of the birth of John the Baptist where it proclaimed that he would do great things for God and would be considered great. Understand this, through our miraculous birth, God says that we can be considered great. So if you're feeling bad about yourself, you need to remember you're a child of God. Amen. And he saved you to do great things. That's part of your miraculous birth. Matthew 5, 19 says, Whosoever shall do and teach the commandments of God, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Right? And that verse I gave you a minute ago where it talked about John, and it said there's no other man born of woman that's greater than John the Baptist. The end of that verse says, Notwithstanding, the least in the kingdom of heaven will be as great. Pretty good stuff. Me? John the Baptist? No. No. Yeah. Yeah. I'm beginning to think. There's something to this miracle before the miracle. Besides just this story, this is relating to me. It's relating to you. How could it be? Is it coincidental that all the things that John was miraculously born for, that you and me were miraculously born for in the family of God? Could it be? Number six, just like John, we're called to be a witness of that true light, which is Jesus by being a light in this world. Remember John 1 where it said he was not the light but he was sent to bear witness of the light. Well I'll read over in 5 Matthew five nineteen, as Jesus was teaching he said something like this you are the light of the world. A city that cannot be hid. A city on the hill that cannot be hid. And then he goes on to say let your light so shine. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven. Are you commanded to be that light? To bear witness of that light? Just like John, right? And John was the miracle before the miracle. You see, so we can clearly see that the miracle of our birth in Christ parallels the miracle of John's birth. You see, John's birth was before Jesus' birth. So what is my birth before? You see, that's where it's losing me. If Jesus was born and John was born before Jesus. I guess the before part, I don't get it. Well, let's go on. I think this to me, you see, this to me is the biggest thing. John was sent to prepare the way for Jesus. That means that John was born before Jesus and he taught people about Jesus before they met Jesus. I think this is the biggest parallel. As a Christian, I was miraculously born so that I can be able to declare Jesus before somebody meets him. You were sent to declare Jesus before somebody meets him, to prepare the way. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, before anyone meets Jesus and accepts Jesus in their life, and that miracle happens of salvation, somebody has prepared the way. And you're called to be that somebody. You're called to be that John the Baptist that is that light, that is that witness, that does great things, that is a miracle from God. Do you know that John was born before Jesus came to this earth for the first time? We know that as the miracle at Beth Bethlehem. We call that season what? John was born before Jesus came to the earth the first time, as we call the miracle of Bethlehem, which we call that season, keyword season, Christmas. But you and I as Christians, we're born in Christ before he comes the next time to take us with him. There's the similarity. How cool is that? Just like John. 
He was born before he came the first time. I'm born before he comes the next time. And I've got a job just like John, right? John's job was to get everybody to meet him. My job is to get everybody to meet him. You see, we're born in the Christ before he comes this next time to take us with him in the miracle of the rapture. You say, we're going to talk about the rapture today? Christmas message? What better time? Amen. Let me just read this to you. Let this roll off for your ears. This is going to happen. If you're a Christian, it's going to involve you. Hey, stop a minute. If you're not a Christian, it's going to involve you too. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible tells us in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, Jesus is coming back. Do you believe that? Do you realize that when he gave you your new birth, it was just like John the Baptist? You were the miracle before the miracle of the rapture when God comes and rescues the church off of this earth? You say, well, what about those that, that, that die? Well, let me tell you about this miracle. What happens is the moment that you and I die, the moment that you and I die, there's a miracle that happens that science can't explain. The soul and the body separate. The Bible says... To be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. At the moment this temporary body ceases to exist, the soul goes to heaven. That's, that, that is a miracle. You know, it's a miracle that people go to hell also. Because at the same time that somebody lost, dies, their soul goes to hell. We don't want to talk about that. It's saying hell, but yeah, it does. We need to talk about it. Why? That's a miraculous thing. So where do you fit into this? Where do I fit in this? You were called as the miracle before the miracle of eternal life happens. You're the John that has to happen before that miracle happens. Your job, whether it's a parent to teach it in your home, a wife to show it in your home, a husband to show it in your home, a friend to a classmate, a schoolmate, a neighbor. Your job is to be the miracle before the miracle. Can you believe there's this many parallels to us and John the Baptist? Pretty awesome stuff. You see, Jesus is coming. And the miracle of our new birth by salvation has to happen before the miracle of his return. So that's the timeline that someone has. Oh, I'll get saved later. You don't have later. So how much time do I have? Well, I don't know. If I would have told you, and if I tell you today, it won't happen at that time because nobody knows, right? It says you'll come in a moment, a twinkling of an eye like a thief in the night. That's why he tells us to watch. You see, every one of us have an opportunity to be the miracle before the miracle. But the miracle of salvation that unites us with God and saves us from an eternity in hell is a miracle that God gives for a specific purpose. Your salvation. Think about it. This is heavy. Just like John, we're supposed to be preparing the way and being a witness for Christ and leading others to him before the miracle happens when Jesus comes the next time. In other words, here's what I'm trying to share with you today. Christians, if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have a great miracle to look forward to, the miracle of heaven. But you're not living in that miracle right now. You're living in the miracle before the miracle, which is your salvation and your life here on earth. I'm living a miracle. Would anybody else know? Would anybody else know you were living a miracle? Maybe you didn't even know yourself. You looked for a miracle a minute ago and it should have been right in the mirror in front of you. It should have been sitting beside of you. How often do we miss that, Christian? God gave us a life. What is your, what is your life? Explain your life, Mike. I'm telling you, it's nothing short of a miracle. As a matter of fact, it's the miracle before the miracle. How can I be sad? I'm not living a dream. I'm living a miracle. 
And if you're a Christian, you are too. And God gave it to you for a specific purpose. Don't miss it. And if you're here today and you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you haven't experienced the miracle yet, but you need to. My job is to share the miracle with you. I want to tell you today that the Lord will knock on your heart's door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. will sup with him and he with me. You know, God will knock on your heart's door. But he only knocks so many times. And he's put people in your life that love you, that share with you and say, listen, listen. God wants to do a miracle in your life. He offers you a miracle that's going to be before the next miracle. If you don't take the first, you won't enjoy the second. So today, this message applies to two different people. To the lost, please accept his miracle. To those that are here that are saved, Fall on your knees before God. If you haven't looked at the miracle that he's made in you, ask him to use that miracle before the miracle in somebody else's life is run out. Ask him to use your life to be that miracle before somebody else's miracle. Pray with me. Father God, I love you. I praise you. Thank you for this day. I thank you, God, for teaching us from your word. I thank you, God, for the miracle of our salvation, of our new birth. I pray, God, that you would minister all over this room today if there are those here who are unsure of their salvation. There are those here that know they're not saved. Lord, give them a great boldness today to ask you for that salvation. I pray that you would just put a hedge protection around them, keep the devil from his influence in the minds of anyone in here, Lord, who is considering opening that door and accepting you. And I pray for Christians all over this room today, Lord, as you hear the prayers of your children, Lord, who have got blinded by the world and have forgotten, Lord, what a miracle we are in you. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the picture of John the Baptist so that we could see ourselves and what a great thing that you've done by saving us so that we could be the miracle before the next miracle. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Would you stand with me? Page 292.
to thank you for coming this morning. And I want to say what a privilege it was to worship the Lord with you this morning. I hope that you were able to see yourself in Scripture. And I hope that God spoke to you and that you can take it from here and apply what He has to, to tell us this morning. Uh, I praise God for the spirit that was in here this morning, for the music that we heard and those that sang that uplifted the name of God and glorified from, oh, come all you faithful from the beginning. You could feel His presence. What a privilege it is to speak to people who are hungry to hear what the Lord has to tell him. I, I feel so blessed to know that, that people are hungry and yearning what he has to say and are not looking for what time they can leave church, but what they can leave here with. And it's such a blessing. I love you. And I pray that I'll see you this evening. Six o'clock, we'll have another service and a lot of practicing and things between now and then, meetings and things that we need to get together on so you know where you need to be. And We've just loved having you today. I pray that, that your day is just a blessed day and that the Lord speaks to you so clearly. If there's no other announcements before we leave, I'll ask Blake to dismiss us in prayer. <laughs> 